Today, the Bondkin returns and the news is good. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined by Steve Van Meter. Hi, Steve. Hi, Martin. Well, the bond kings were right, or should I say the bond markets were right? Well, yeah, they, they, they figured out that all of this hype and, you know, if you look at, say, the factory diffusion indices, and all this hope for inflation is really not going to last much longer than you and I have talked about it last, that it's gonna be transitory. And so uh, all the bond market telling us right now is, yeah, prices may be going up and you may be excited about inflation, but hold tight, uh, this soon shall pass. <laughs> and I find what's really interesting is that the main proponents of you know inflation's coming have been those with gold interests and those in investment banks who, of course, are trying to trade volatility, right? So they've actually got motivations to try and talk it up. Um, and, and yet, on the other hand, you've got the Fed saying, well, you know, it might be, um, you know, a, a little bit, but only transitory, and there are reasons for that. Um, but structurally speaking, it looks as though you and I are probably more on the right side of history here. Yeah, so you look at what the Fed had to say. It was really interesting because, and you know this because I know you you follow the Fed as well, they rarely tell you anything useful. <laughs> Uh, but Powell actually did say that the base effects that they estimate are adding 1% to the story. So if you look at last month's number, you could say, well, I think it was 2.6. So that means the real number was 1.6. Estimates for April are coming at 3.6, which is, which is pretty high. And I, you know, some of you have asked, do you think it's going to get there? You, you know, it can, uh, but the real number will be, you know, 1% less. But the, the real the real issue that I'm looking at is crude oil prices. And if you look, you know, a year ago, somewhere uh, late April, well, we had that that negative, that bottom in crude oil. And then that's going to get priced out going forward because by May, prices have came, come back and then June, July, so forth. So we are going to see those base effects. Now, whether the peak print will be in April or in May, I don't know. I'm, I'll put my money on April, but it could be May. And after that, by June the base effects are all washed out. So what I'm looking at is not the year over year number, is I'm, I'm now interested in the month over month. Are we gonna see those big month over month prints? Don't think we're going to, but it'll, it'll certainly be interesting to see the, what, what we see on Wednesday for sure. Well, I was interested that one of the uh, investment banks spoke about transitory hyperinflation, which sounds to me just weird, right? I mean, basically it's gonna go up a lot for a bit, but then it's not gonna be sustained. And interestingly, we're seeing similar um, you know, conversation in other countries too around the world, even here in Australia. But actually, the the um, the Reserve Bank here is talking about uh, you know inflation is going to struggle. And look, I guess it comes back to a definitional question too, right? Because you can obviously look at costs, you can look at money supply, you can look at wages growth. Well, I can tell you, I've done some work. There's very little correlation between inflation and money supply, right? Unlike what most people think, right? The yeah, that. Is that's that's interesting because we keep hearing this you know 12 months ago we had this uh, or back in march 2020 a huge spike in the u.s money supply all right this is going to be inflation we heard this month after month 12 months later still not there here we are uh looking at april's data and maybe we'll get 3.6 percent as you mentioned that's not hyperinflation and yeah will it be transitory yeah, absolutely but yeah what we're learning is there really is no relationship between or modern day, I think in the past there absolutely was, but there's no modern day relationship between the money supply and the consumer price index. And part of that reason now is, an, as you and I have talked about, is a negative impact quantitative easing has on it. And I don't, I don't know when the, the story will end for, for all the people who are money supply inflationists, but uh, I think in the next couple of months, they won't have much to talk about. <laughs> no, absolutely. And certainly here in Australia, wages growth is absolutely nowhere, right? So whilst corporate profits have actually been quite strong, wages growth have gone absolutely nowhere at all. And interestingly, here now, the uh, Reserve Bank is talking about needing to get um, the unemployment rate down to a three-something, right, rather than a four-something or a five-something. So a very significant drop. And in fact, they made a really interesting comment last week, which was they're going to be prepared to trade off much higher house prices to try and get inflation down right uh, wow. uh, to try and get inflation up and um unemployment down right so they're actually trying to 
make this sort of really weird sort of weird trade-off between which would you prefer high house prices or would you like to have lower unemployment i mean that's a really wacky argument yeah well i mean it seems like australians would pick higher house prices i don't know i mean i don't live there you do but uh it seems like housing prices are a big issue there i, I think people would rather have their own prices go up uh, but yeah it's interesting that they're trading off and, and what and but wages aren't growing that much and here there's a lot of talk about okay wages are going to go up because employers are struggling and i keep saying look the employers are smart enough to know that the stimulus is is transitory i mean the, the big checks are gone. I mean, I, I think at the end of uh, April, 85% of the U.S. stimulus checks have gone out. So leaving 15% for May is not much. And yeah, our employers hurting. Our, you know, maybe it takes a little longer if you go to the restaurant or something like that to get what you need. But I think employers can wait that out. I think they will wait it out. And if they do bring back people at a higher wage, well, guess who's going to go the next time around? Uh, or we're going to see even more automation. And you, we see that in the productivity data that, boy, employees are working a little bit longer. And, man, they're doing a lot more work for their time. And uh, as you know, Martin, uh, when you have very uh, productivity, that's the wrong word, for uh, employees, they're very, you know, really good at getting their job done efficiently. You don't need a lot of other workers. No, that's exactly right. And if you look at the job mix, of course, um, there are more and more people in you know, low-paid, important jobs like healthcare jobs and uh, old age care jobs. I call them the bedpan economy jobs, right? Very critical, but by definition, they're not going to create huge value in terms of a multiplier effect in the economy, right? This, this is basically part of the problem of productivity that we've got. So there are some sectors that are very pro productive, you know, but if you look at it overall, the growth in jobs is not actually necessarily directly linked to the growth in the economy. No. Unfortunately, uh, and, and I think there's, you know, the Fed's put a lot of stake in that, and we hear the, the Fed specifically talking about, like, all right, well, we're not going to raise rates, we're not going to tighten monetary policy, we get all these jobs back, and everyone's like, okay, and uh, that number is 8 million jobs, and based on the current rate of uh, our trajectory of job creation, we're talking almost three years, and then, of course, it was like, well, that will be inflationary, because a little over a year ago, before the pandemic, we were at full employment, and we were seeing disinflation, the, the problem always comes back to wage growth. And this is something that you know I talked about in my show today is, you know, when you're in a global economy, you're competing against workers in other places. And one of the things that I thought, and, I, and we probably talked about this is, if you can work from home, there's someone else in the world that can do your job for less money. Because all, the, all now the question is, there's an internet connection. And yeah, they may be a little bit slower, but they're working for a fraction of the wage. And yeah, they speak English and all, a lot of other languages. So I, I, I know a lot of workers here want to work from home. I don't, I don't blame them. It, you know, it saves you money. It, it's just great. But now all of a sudden you're opening up uh, an, a, an educated global workforce that can compete for your job and employers know it. Yeah, that's already seeing that uh, in a number of uh, industries here as well, where, uh, you know, chunks of expertise are being effectively outsourced to other countries, where, as you say, it's a lot cheaper. In the IT sector particularly, we're seeing a, a, a lot of it at the moment. So, you know, w w we can say that money supply really doesn't have any impact on inflation. The jobs uh, and wages, you know, is not the story. And by the way, of course, your jobs numbers last week was shockingly low, which really shook a few people, right? <laughs> Yeah, way, way off last week, yeah. Um, now, whether that's a spike, we'll see. But then the third one is obviously cost of goods. Now, there are some input costs, right? We know cost of lumber's going up. We know that, that there are some other, uh, you know, uh, costs of production going up. But, but in the scheme of things, it's a relatively small chunk of the overall economy. Yeah, and, and what I think people miss about all that is the supply-demand component. So if... If I'm on a, you know, so I'm at a fixed wage or whatever it is, and the cost of crude oil goes up, so the cost of gasoline goes up, so the cost of my commute and driving goes up, well, that takes away spending from other places. And that's the part that people really miss. They think, okay, well, if lumber prices and iron ore and crude and all these commodity prices go up, well, that's inflation. Well, historically, that hasn't done it either. I mean, the real trick to getting inflation is you need two important things. You need wages to go up and you need debt to go down because what does that create the door open for? Discretionary spending. And that's where you really get inflation, but you too much debt 
or or if you have a lot of debt, you just need your wages to grow a lot faster. And that I don't see that happening. Not with not with this uh, the large unemployment we have. Employers employers are whining today, but they know uh, at least here in the United States by September they're going to have a line of people looking for work, and they're going to they're going to take the best of the best. Mm. Right. So basically, no real structural signs, and you know I, I I'd agree with that. We've also got, of course, rates, interest rates, really, really low, ultra low, right at the moment. And uh, as we've said before, that in itself has a deflationary effect, right? And the quantitative easing, which effectively is moving money from A to B, but not actually necessarily going into the real economy, right? And then the, th right. the, 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 the anywhere, yeah. And then the third factor is the government stimulus, you know, the, you know, the, the Biden packages. But a lot of that is already flown through, right, or is going to be long term. So it's not necessarily going to either stick to the real economy either. So the question is, where are the seeds of inflation laid? Yeah, and they don't exist. They, they just exist in this transitory stuff. And people look and say, well, but look at the year over year rate of change. Yeah, you go from you know, depressed number to anything higher and it's going to look good. The question is always the follow through. You know, like you mentioned, we know the stimulus is one off. We know we know low rates are deflationary. Now they can be briefly inflationary if they create a lot of lending growth. But here in the U.S., we're seeing lending contraction and even in the three month rate of change and lending growth, it's virtually zero. So you're not seeing any money creation there either. So yeah, the, you, you look at what will create sustainable inflation and the answer is we don't have anything for it. And I think the Fed knows it, which is why they're saying, look, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep easing, we're gonna do it for a long time. Uh, and then maybe they got a gift with the payroll numbers because right before, and I don't remember, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a lot of all of a sudden chatter going into that payroll report about, okay, there's gonna be the talk of the talk of the taper coming at Jackson Hole, and all of a sudden those are nope, that's you know that's gone. So yeah, I don't think there's any any chance that the Fed, the Fed, I don't think the Fed wants to, and I, I think the Fed realizes from past mistakes that that they believe what they're doing will work. But I think they realize that they cut it off too early in the past, so this time they're not going to make that mistake. Unknowingly, it's going to lead to more disinflation. Mm. Well, it's creating a sinkhole, isn't it? And that sinkhole is getting bigger and bigger and just sucking more in. Interestingly, here in Australia, we have had some credit growth, but it's all directly related to the house lending, right? Where all the government stimulus has pulled forward demand and got people to to, to, to go and buy houses. Uh, we're also seeing banks now loosening their lending standards to try and actually drive more people into into, into the mortgage sector. Uh, and property investors are beginning to come back. They sort of took a, a bit of a break for a couple of years. But interestingly, if you look at business investment, lending for business investment is still going backwards. So that's a signal that, again, you're not necessarily building momentum into the real economy for the future. And in fact, in the budget that we've got coming out tonight, there's going to be massive government spending. So this is basically on the conservative side of politics, but they're throwing the kitchen sink at the economy. Now, if everything was going well and infl if inflation was, you know, coming along and uh, growth was coming along, why would they be throwing all this money at the economy? That's the question that nobody wants to answer. There's something disconnected, right? It's the same in the US. Why is so much stimulus and QE happening when the metrics are so low? Well, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to explain to me because at the moment it seems to me that uh, both the central banks and the governments are fixated on a particular set of levers they're trying to pull. The trouble is those levers are actually rather elastically connected to what the real world is. <laughs> they're pulling them and nothing much is happening. Yeah, and, and I want to echo that the lending standards that you mentioned that are easy in Australia, it, the, exactly the same thing we're seeing here. And I, I think we kind of knew that was going to happen when lending and contraction banks were going to like, oh, wait, we need to get some borrowers in. But you, you made a really good point, and I think this is worth spending some time on, is we pulled the man forward. Now, I think they did the stimulus wrong. Now, I'm going to say that and I'm going to qualify it saying that there was no real other way they could do it. But the right way to do it would have been to say, all right, we're going to extend you know, jobless benefits or do what we need to do to get people back to work. And when you're all back to work at a certain level, then we're going to drop some money on you. But the problem is we did it now and we pulled this huge amount of demand for homes, cars, electronics. 
what's going to happen and i think i think you hit the nail on the head when you said these these businesses know it they're not investing they know this demand is a, about to drop off a huge cliff because the people won't have the money to spend on it and they were are realizing you know and if and if they didn't this last you know us jobs report made it really clear hey there was supposed to be a million a million and a half jobs created there was less than you know three hundred thousand. Oh, and it turned out about half of those were made up by the BLS as part of their uh, business birth death model. So now we've got a problem. You pull the man forward. Businesses know it, and they're not really hiring that much, even though they're acting you know like oh we need people and you know boohoo for us. Wow, yeah, they they know this demand is gone, and we know the supply chains are full of supply. We know there we know there's lumber out there. It's just not getting where it needs to. We know there's ships coming out of South Korea. They're just not here. We know that the the you know the supply is is there. It's the supply chain that's broken. Once the supply chain gets fixed, and demand from all the stimulus checks is gone, you know what's left? Now all of a sudden, I think we're gonna have the opposite problem. Yeah, you know, we went from too much inventory to too little inventory, and then we're gonna be back at too much inventory, but no one to buy it. Mm. Yeah, well, it's. I- I think um, those supply chain disruptions, of course, in Australia, because we're so far from everywhere, we, we often get exposed to some of those and we're seeing it at the moment in, in the construction sector. It's interesting because the, the government threw huge stimulus into the construction sector to try and get people to buy homes, right? And now all those builders are rushing around trying to get m- materials to build the homes <laughs> and they can't because essentially they can't get the supply. So what that means right. is that there's a delay now before they can actually complete those um, particular uh, projects that are there. So the whole thing has been the wrong way around. I absolutely agree with you. The stimulus programs, and you know, stimulus was required, particularly through the recovery. The stimulus programs were, were were the wrong way around. So they they did the cart and the horses in the wrong order. So not surprising, it doesn't necessarily end up where you think it's going to end up. Yeah, and but politically they had no other choice because it's you know you look at the U.S. and could the Biden administration get away with saying okay we're going to do this now we're going to pass another one later and then maybe another no they had that's the problem with politics you you pretty much got one and maybe two chances I mean you, you definitely have one when you're a brand new president I mean you've got you're going to get something you want through because hey you just got elected the people elected you for a reason Congress will go along with that but as we're already seeing with you know, the, the infrastructure package that he wants, it, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And if it does, it's going to be really watered down and they're going to have to use another reconciliation. And then after that, you have the midterms here and all bets are off. So, yeah, they had no choice, but they could have put some incentives on what, how the spending was going to be, maybe to incentivize people to get vaccinated or, you know, a, a, a bonus if they got a job and had to vaccine. I don't know. There's some maybe they could have done, but it was probably easier and faster to do it the way they did it. But by the third quarter, it's going to be really clear that uh, all this demand that got pulled forward is gone. Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting, uh, just moving the conversation slightly forward. Um, did you see that at the end of last month, Powell used the F word, the frothy word, right? Now, he was referring specifically, I think, to cryptos, but he did actually say, look, some of the markets are a bit frothy. Go on. Yeah, yeah, he referred to it twice. Yeah. So he used the word froth twice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and that's something we central bankers are supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting because the... Media didn't pick it up immediately, right? It was, I, I was yeah. fascinated. I don't know why that was, because it, that was, for me, quite a material statement. Yeah, because I, I, I think what, and this is, you can go back, and there was a point where President Trump said, hey, y'all, I mean, he was championing stocks going up. Remember, every time you know he spoke, the algorithms were, were jamming stocks up. And one point, he's like, look, you need to sell some of your stocks and go buy some stuff. I'm like, yeah, it's funny that a rising stock market that people are chasing doesn't lead to consumption because people don't want to sell. And now all of a sudden you have Powell going like, yeah, maybe this thing's a little overvalued, but people, uh, nothing really changes. I mean, people aren't going to sell. That's the whole thing about markets. People buy the most at the top, sell the most at the bottom. But from an economic perspective, would it be great to see people pulling money out and spending it? I mean, that that would actually be helpful. But maybe the people at the top, you know, because the stock market in the U.S. Um, is mostly owned by the wealthiest 50 percent. It appears based on all the data that they really don't have anything to buy. I mean, they have pretty much bought all the homes and cars and stuff they want. So I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, it was, it was odd to hear him say that. I, I don't think I even heard the first time he said it because you have that filter that central bankers don't say words like that publicly. <laughs> well, I made a show called um, "The Feds in the F Word," right, and it got quite a few f- few hits because uh, you know it was it was not expected. But there is a really important point here: is that we've got um, you know financial markets hitting the hot tops. You know, the the Dow hit an- another high. The uh, tech index is down a little bit, and there are reasons for that, which I think make quite a lot of sense. They've probably overvalued, and if future rates are higher, that means their discounted value is is down a bit. Um, so I still think we've got this risk of a very toppy market beginning to realise that um, all of the future that was baked in is not necessarily completely the full story. So you've got to say it looks pretty precipitous from here. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the, like you said, tech stocks definitely are starting to form, look like a topping pattern, small caps topping pattern, bond, U.S. Treasuries bottoming you know, pattern. I mean, you start to see these things. And you look at, you know, we've talked about the money multiplier, which is really you know, probably the best ratio to determine you know, future infl- potential for future inflation or disinflation, which is simply, uh, for your listeners who aren't familiar with it, is the M2 money supply divided by the monetary base. And it declined last month, which I was shocked. I mean, as someone who follows this every month, I was expecting the money supply to go up. I'm not expecting it to go up this month or any month after that. So perhaps the market is just starting to feel the disinflationary effects of QE, which at some point, as I've said, the all you know, everyone that says interest rates can only go up during QE is at some point they're gonna mop up the bond market and that's it. And I think we're seeing, you know, we're close to the end of this bottoming pattern. Perhaps it is just a lack of liquidity, and you see a lot of bo- a mar- uh, like Amazon issued 18 and a half billion of debt today. So you're seeing other things coming along, but yeah, the, the market looks toppy and without stimulus, right? Because a lot of people are getting their checks and out buying stocks. Well, as we just talked about a little bit ago, that party's pretty much over. And then we have uh, tax day uh, next Monday here in the U.S. So. You know, there's going to be people pulling out money, writing checks. That's not going to be inflationary because that's going out of the money supply. So perhaps stocks are just finally reacting to the, dis- the broader disinflationary forces without this mountain of, of, of stimulus hitting, hitting consumer checks. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got this theory. I've had it for a little while that uh, September, October this year is going to be quite interesting, right? We, quite often, if you look back historically, it's been that uh, September, October time when the markets have sort of woken up a bit and realised that, well, hang on, maybe things aren't quite so good as we thought. So, um, you know, if, if history repeats itself, we could actually be looking at that sort of time frame. I don't know. I mean, nobody can predict it. There's so many uncertainties. But I would be quite cautious at the moment buying in at, this, at these high levels, right? Because it, it I can't see the reason that prices would go dramatically higher from where they are, because everything's, you know, baked in for perfection, and yet we're now seeing cracks around perfection, right? <laughs> so, well, well, and we're, we're risking losing another summer travel season. Yep. And, you know, we, we've talked, I know you and I talked about this before, about how many businesses you know, make lion's share of their money on the, over, over the summer months, the travel season, and to get through the winter months. And there are still, there are countries now that, you know, have travel restrictions. I think people are still less likely to travel. I mean, what we just found out in Florida that you know uh, spring break led to a, an outbreak of a bunch of the variants. So I think there are people that are going to be real nervous about it. And if we lose another travel season, well, what's you know we may not get to September before you know what your you know the equity market rolls over. We might see it sooner because there's just so much money that flows around travel. Mm. You know that is really critical, and I'm I'm not sure we're going to get. I would kind of my belief was we needed this travel season to come back. You know I'm not hearing a lot of people talking about making big vacation plans. I mean, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But you know, without people going back to work, without stimulus checks, what what is left other than corporate share buybacks to hold the U.S. market up, and that's not enough to keep it up by itself. No, absolutely. Well, interesting. Here we've got. Um news now that the international borders will stay shut until next year right so fortress australia we have right and and they're basically saying uh you know we're going to have to focus on the local economy and people should travel in you know across australia and that sort of thing and in fact we've almost got captive 
people now who can't travel overseas so they're spending locally right that's about the only upside right the other side of it is of course all businesses are grizzling now because they can't get workers and they're saying oh you know we need international workers to come in because of course they don't pay them as much as they pay local workers so that's another uh, you know critical mix in terms of trying to understand what the economy is doing so so i don't see that um international travel is really going to come back anytime soon certainly for australia which is another you know depressing thought in terms of trying to actually get the economy to sort of come back to some normal point now everybody's quote quoting the top level metrics which is you know well growth is good etc etc but it's all very artificial and i come back to this yeah and how much money got thrown in we, we've spent in australia since the beginning of covid about one trillion dollars of state and federal government money to try and prop up the economy so it's not surprising that the numbers don't look too bad superficially but you just peel back the onion and you can see the cracks appearing below yeah uh, and i think businesses are going to run out of money in a matter of months in fact today i just saw an article that says the paycheck protection program here is now out of money uh, i mean if you are if you are in if you had filed and you're in the queue you're okay but I, if there's no summer travel season, if people are not moving money around, I, I, you know, the last data I saw is a lot of small businesses were months away from failure. I, I don't think they make it. I mean, and, and, you know, from just an inflationary standpoint, what do we need? We need dollars leaving the United States, going to Australia, Japan, Europe, Asia. I mean, we, you're, uh, you know, United Kingdom, we need dollars leaving. We need people getting on cruise ships and airplanes and, you know, and traveling and spending that money. And without it, I don't know that governments, I mean, I mean, looking at the U.S. alone, we're not going to get another stimulus package until we maybe get an infrastructure bill, which that's not a guarantee at this point. The question is, can business, do businesses have the money to get through? I don't think they do, especially without the consumers, you know, getting these checks to go spend. I think it's all at the wrong time. <laughs> Well, interesting, the retail stats over the first quarter here were down compared with the previous quarter because obviously there was a bounce back because of what happened previously. So from very low base, it went up, but now it's come down again. And I've um, been walking around some of the, the streets uh, around different um, parts of Australia, virtually as well as um, you know physically. And the number of retail stores that are for let, the number that are just vacant, it's remarkable, even in some of the major commercial centers. So it looks to me as though my data is showing it too. The SME sector in particular and retail in particular is still struggling. So there are some doing well, but many not. So, you know, wherever you look, you can see signs that uh, things are still not very um, much coming back to where they perhaps were previously. And, you know, long, slow grind. Um, and that's the point that I think you've made and, you know, we'll make it again. Businesses can carry on for a certain de a, a, a length of time, but eventually, you know, the gravity pulls them back into the black hole unless they can start um, uh, ejecting weight, i.e. making people re redundant or find ways to sell more. And that's where a lot of businesses are. They're sort of getting sucked back in at the moment. So expect more, more pain ahead, I think, for the commercial sector. Yeah, in one place, I, I mean, because uh, I think you, like you said, you do your virtual and physical walk. One uh, to look, and I think that's fantastic. I encourage people to do that all the time. One thing I like to look at, I think you might agree with me on this, Martin, is I always look at restaurants because when people have money, extra money, what are the first thing they want to do? They want to go out to eat. And I don't look at just any restaurants. I want to know what the popular places are, the ones where you drive by and you're like, oh, it's it's five o'clock there's a line out the door where are those places are the parking lots full are they half full are the people standing around what's the story with them because if those places aren't busy then you can guarantee all the other ones the small ones the mom and pops and other places they're not busy either and you know some of these big retail chains have the the resources to go out to the equity market the bond market and keep alive it's the mom and pops that that don't and and that's really the problem because they employ a lot of people and you know if you have four locations you go down to three because that's what you can get by with well that just losing that one location there's just so many jobs there's a knock-on effect to that that people don't realize and yeah i, I think i think there's the, like you said that black hole effect it, it, it's going to just suck everyone out but that's what deflation is supposed to do it's supposed to pull everything down reset the system and then go and we're fighting that I mean, we're fighting the gravitational forces of it 
and it's and, and once we get through these base effects, I think it's going to be clear that we didn't win. Mm. And I don't know what central bankers are going to do or think about it, but the, maybe the stock market will realize that the central bankers can't prop up equity prices up forever. Yeah, well, there will be, I think, a limit. But the question is, where, where, when and where will that limit be? We, we don't know. Now, before I close today, you, you shared some news with me before we went live that you've got this new project that you're um, just going with. So let's just explore that for a second. Yeah, so I, I've been working on something called Momentum Timer Pro. A lot of people have been asking for a, you know, more of like a subscription product. And when I really looked into what people want, they want something to give them buy and sell signals. And so I use something called momentum, which is something very, very few people do. Uh, if you look out in the subscription world, you see people that you know, have opinions based on maybe the ISM cycles or different quadrants of the inflation, deflation cycles. But there's only really two things that matter in terms of price. Uh, there's the directions going up or down price itself and the rate of that change. And so what I've done is I've taken all my data and unfortunately the copy I sent you, I can't distribute yet but because of compliance purposes but what this is going to have is going to be more of a macro based newsletter that's going to look at different time scales and give people buy and sell signals and then position sizing and the cool thing is i'm going to release it for free for several months so when it's finally ready we're going to put a website up you can put their email in and then we're going to get feedback from it and the powerful thing for those of you listening you know from australia and other countries is well what you're going to see right now is just u.s etfs and, and foreign etf but I'll have actual access to any listed security in the Morningstar database and any exchange that shows up. So uh, what we're going to do is run it for free, get people's feedback, expand upon it. And then you know, my goal is to, you know, if it's popular enough, to release it for a very low price to give people you know, access to buy and sell signals. Again, position sizing. You know, do I go all in? Well, no. OK, so what do I need to do to limit my you know, my risk exposure. Well, it's all based on formulas that I wrote, that I use, that I put together. So I'm excited about it. And unfortunately, um, you, you can put a picture of it on the screen, but we can't have anyone download it just yet. But the great thing is, like I said, when it is ready, um, I'll let you know, Martin, it's going to be for free for a while. So as a thank you to my fans and your fans who have supported me and everything you've done for me, and I appreciate all that. So I want to give back to everybody. Most well, terrific. And uh, it sounds a very exciting project. I had a quick look through. Uh, we won't put the whole thing off, obviously, but we might just show a little bit of a, you know, a, a blurred shot or something. But um, very interesting. So when, it, when it's ready to go, let me know and we'll, we'll make a show about it and uh, make a bit of a splash. Because I, I think you're absolutely right. People are really looking for, you know, some signals and some alternatives in terms of how to think about things. Uh, because, you know, a lot of them don't necessarily buy the mainstream arguments or buy what other people necessarily are saying oh go gold or whatever so, so it's really good to have um you know an alternative voice so very interesting and exciting and uh, i'll look forward to seeing its development and steve i really appreciate your time today i always enjoy speaking with you we always have managed to find uh, an interesting path through <laughs> through the economic mire <laughs> Yeah, I was looking forward to this, so I'm really glad. It's, uh, it's always a blast. We just jump off the edge and see where we go. We never know. Exactly. And uh, we'll talk again soon, Steve. Have a great day. Cheers. You too. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye.